that recording? Very good. Uh, this session will be recorded and both the recording and the PowerPoint slides will be posted uh, uh, to the web and we will um, let you know where those will be if you are registered to the session. Uh, also, a website for the anti-racism interest group is in development and I wanted to give a big shout out to Nichelle Hazlett for her heroic uh, work on this. Um, so we'll be sharing resources that we've been collecting and um, keep a lookout for the announcement about that as well. Um, please mute yourself when you are not presenting or directly asking a question um, at the end of the sessions um, and use the chat uh, feature of uh, this Zoom window to direct questions um, to our speakers, or if you do have technical questions, please direct them directly to Bobray Bordelon, who is our technical support for this session. And I hope you know how to do that in chat. You can specify his name. Um, we will be taking questions. Uh, however, we will hold all questions until after all of our panelists have an opportunity to present. So uh, feel free to enter those questions at any time in the chat when they do come up for you. Okay. Um, so to just give a little context for this conversation that we're hoping to hold with you, um, in the United States in 2020, it was sort of a landmark um, year and not always in a good way. Uh, there were so many events that brought the many issues surrounding social justice, race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, sexuality, and other issues uh, of that prompt discrimination in our society. And it gave us a renewed urgency about how to address and uh, address all of these issues. And of course, prior to that year, uh, uh, all around the world, we have seen events of war and conflict and persecution of peoples due to racial, ethnic, and all sorts of issues of personal identity. Uh, and these are on the rise one result of which has been an ongoing refugee crisis that challenges the capacity of nations and the international community to provide asylum, humanitarian aid, and simple human compassion. The work of the Anti-Racism Resources Interest Group was prompted by these events, which added, again, renewed urgency to our ability to support researchers seeking and working with data sets to address these issues. This interest group has several subgroups that welcome new members. Uh, and the, this webinar is the first of what we hope will be a series of sessions to support ongoing discussion and exploration of the issues that impact researchers, data archivists, librarians, and other information specialists when working with data that attempts to qualify characteristics of the human condition, such as race, ethnicity, ancestry, national origin, gender, sexuality, and other aspects of individual identity. Uh, the recording, uh, so by focusing initially on census data, which is a commonly available across most national uh, entities, we hope to illustrate the range of challenges to data-driven research and data collecting practices, and particularly efforts to do comparative work, whether over time or across geographies that are posed by the differences in national practices and definitions for the terms race, ethnicity, ancestry, and so forth. We also recognize that this kind of data has been and can be used to target individuals and groups for further harm and marginalization, which further complicates the challenges of creating and curating such data sets. I'd like to make a comment at the outset our speakers are not necessarily experts in the very difficult, difficult methodological and epistemological issues that arise when attempting to build accurate data sets that characterize aspects of individual identities. Rather, they are sharing with us what they have learned in their efforts to support researchers with locating and using data on these uh, factors. Also, I want to add a, 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 a word about terminology. Uh, due to the historical nature of some of the data sources discussed during this webinar, language may be used that is problematic or uh, outright offensive to contemporary users. 
Please keep in mind that the vocabulary used to refer to racial, ethnic, religious, and cultural groups is specific to the period when the data was collected and does not reflect the attitudes and views of contemporary society in most cases or any of our speakers. We hope this panel presentation will be the beginning of an ongoing conversation supported by additional presentations and we welcome your engagement with the panelists today and the program organ organizers uh, by sharing your questions in the chat. Questions will be addressed, as I mentioned earlier, after all of the presentations. Okay, so let's get on with it, shall we? Um, each of our panelists will speak for 10 minutes in the order listed on this slide. <laughs> um, it, I will uh, serve as the timekeeper. And rather than lengthy introductions at this point, I will ask each speaker to introduce themselves at the start of their presentation. So let me turn the presentation over to Kevin Manuel of Toronto. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Hello, thank you, Anne. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Kevin Manuel. I'm the data librarian at Toronto Metropolitan University in Toronto, Canada, and I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues, Alex Cooper at Queens and Rosa Orlandini at York. Next. So quickly, um, we're just going to be covering um, the history of the census here and uh, discussing the various factors that we've um, um, covered in the uh, presentation. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, we'll talk about the racialized data guide that we've created, the uh, census timeline that we've uh, made available, and we're going to illustrate this through sample questions that we've received from researchers. Next. So uh, the Canadian census is conducted every five years. And, and of course, terminology around racialized and indigenous peoples have changed uh, over time. So currently right now, the Canadian census, which was last conducted in 2021, asks about ethnicity, visible minorities, and indigenous identity. And <clears throat> there are questions at this time uh, whether some of these classifications can uh, actually reflect uh, Canadian society right now. Next. So, uh, of course, the census is connected to colonization, and we're starting this presentation with Canada because it bridges um, both the UK, uh, which uh, Canada was part of the British Empire, and from the influence from the south from uh, our neighbours, uh, the United States. And, but the first census in Canada was conducted uh, in 1665 mm. in the French colonies of New France. And, and um, of course, uh, New France became part of British North America in 1759. Next. Um, Just a reminder, to mute, everyone can mute, please. Thank you. So Canada um, confederated in 1867, and the first census was conducted in 1871. So that map there certainly illustrates a very different country than um, what it is today. And the census has been conducted every 10 years until 1951. Next, please. So since 1951, the census has been conducted every five years, and our most recent census uh, is 2021. And here's an example of a map of the Indigenous populations in Canada from our most recent census. But looking back at the history of the census, um, if you go back to our 2011 uh, census, <clears throat> There's two parts to the Canadian census, the short form, which is mandatory for 100% of the population, and the short form, which, uh, the long form, which is sent out to 20%. Uh, the government at that time decided to cancel the mandatory long form census, which had questions about uh, ethno-racial populations. And uh, the impact of that was um, negative impacts on a lot of social policy across the country. And in 2016, uh, the new government at that time reinstated the uh, long form census and has been that way since. Next. So uh, in 2021, 2020, during the pandemic, we had a little um, idea to create uh, uh, a, a guide for 
um, racialized and indigenous peoples. And so my colleagues, Alex, Moira, and Rosa and I um, uh, developed uh, a guide through uh, the Ontario Council of University Libraries. And, uh, next slide. And this is available online and open uh, to the world. So um, uh, it's hosted through a platform called Scholars Portal. And so in this guide, you can see what resources are available about ethno-racial uh, data um, across uh, different areas, but also uh, more specifically a guide about the census. Next. And so within the guide, which is in PDF format, it illustrates the uh, changes in terminology uh, between 1870 and 2021 and the sources to be able to go to, to look at uh, how these uh, um, variables have changed over time about racialized and indigenous peoples. Next. So here's an example of the 1911. So you can see um, the different categories that were included. So um, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, they started to include uh, terms that were related to racial identity. Before then, it was um, uh, origin. Next. Hmm. Next slide. Yep. Uh, thank you. So in 1921, we can see there was more detail. And then uh, next. 1926, uh, here's an example of a special census, which is called a census of the prairies. And so within these, we provide the sources, the links to be able to go back and find where um, uh, the resources are for these and specific censuses. Next. So we'll start with a type of question that we would um, receive um, as, as data experts and, and specialists. So uh, we're going to look at this question here. Researchers looking to compare changes in time about uh, Indigenous communities over the past 150 years. Next. So to look at uh, this as in a contemporary context, so we would go to the Stats Canada page, see that 5% of the population identifies as Indigenous, indigenous now, but terminology has changed over time. Next. So using the guide that we created, these um, are the uh, classifications that um, we've illustrated in there. So uh, we can see that in the 19th century, it was under origin as Indian. In the early 20th century, um, Indian was defined as Aboriginal through mother. And then in 1941 and 1951, um, it was identity was changed uh, to the father's side. So these were traditional matrilineal societies. So we can see the colonial influence that's changing how um, identity is uh, collected about communities. Uh, in the 60s to the 80s, it was Native Indian. And in 1981, Métis uh, was added as a choice of um, response for the census. Next. In 1986, then there was the change for uh, Aboriginal. And um, before uh, 1996, um, Aboriginal or identity, Indigenous identity was included in uh, ethnic uh, origin, not as a distinct category. But after that, it was a distinct category. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 2021, uh, the most recent change is that the term Indigenous has replaced Aboriginal. But it's important to know when working with researchers that these, these, this terminology is not changed retroactively. So to have the guide and be able to compare this terminology over time is really important. Next. So First Nations includes various terms such as Indian, Native American, Native Indian. Um, and Inuit has changed over time. It was included as Indian um, up till 1931 and then Eskimo from the 40s to the 70s. Uh, Métis, uh, I'm not even going to say that, and uh, has been classified as different, um, uh, probably inappropriate terms there. Next. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the 2021 census, uh, 63 Indigenous communities um, uh, didn't participate. So when you're collecting the data, uh, there's sovereignty issues. And, um, um, where that Indigenous communities and collect their own data uh, and um, um, that's within their own purview to, to do that and they don't participate within the census. Next. So important considerations to take into mind, terminology changes over time. Uh, are they included or identified within the census? And, uh, was the data collected but not shared? And 
but you have to think there's also displacement and assimilation of indigenous peoples through colonization. So is the data accurately represented? And there are sovereignty rights um, where indigenous peoples collect data themselves. Next. So the next question I just want to uh, share with you is um, uh, a researcher is looking for a race category to identify historical Black Caribbean immigration patterns in Canada. So when we're looking at race uh, within the Canadian context, um, the 19th century, uh, it was place of origin. Uh, early 20th century, the term racial origins uh, was used. And, um, in 46, uh, race was removed uh, by ethnic origin in the uh, Prairie uh, Census. 51, uh, origin was reintroduced, and from the 60s to the 80s, ethnic or cultural group was used. Next. So uh, Thompson refers to the 1981 census, and you know it illustrates a legacy of colonialism here, that racialized Jamaican descended respondents reported that they were British, while those Haitian descent were identified as French. Next. So in 86, as a way to address this, uh, a new variable was added, which was called visible minority. And there it illustrates the different uh, classifications that were added for that. Next. Uh, but the challenge with the visible minority, it's often difficult for uh, Canadians to compare to other countries. Um, and although most countries collect um, uh, uh, ethnicity data instead of race, there is no sort of international ethno-racial data classification. Thus, it requires some forms of harmonization. Next. So here are the visible minority categories compared to uh, the United States. So we can see the challenge here in um, comparing internationally uh, the different categories from different censuses. Next. So. Uh, Researchers in Canada have responded in saying that, um, you know, there are challenges with the visible minority uh, and that it should be referred to as racialized populations. Um, so in a meeting with um, uh, Statistics Canada last week with uh, a lot of the data professionals in Canada, they've said that from um, going forward, they're going to refer to uh, visible minority as racialized in their publications. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when we're talking about racialized communities, think about how census terminology has changed. Our identities changed due to colonial legacies. Uh, are there indicators for respondents that are racialized and what are those indicators? Is there intersectionality of this and who is count, not counted and why? Next slide. So we have an article coming out, um, uh, Alex, Rosa, and I, in a, a special issue of the ISIS quarterly on um, systemic racism and data practices, and it's called Who is Counted? Ethno-Racial and Indigenous Identities in the Census of Canada, 1871 to 2021 in December. So please keep your eyes open for that. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm Barbara Levergood, Data Services Librarian at Bowdoin College in Maine in the US. Next slide. And next slide. Next slide, please. There's an enormous amount to learn about the US census and race and ethnicity. And I've studied the census for many years and I'm still learning. Uh, we'll talk here about what data are collected, how they're collected and published, and I'll provide just a snippet from the history of data collection. I've put a lot of it, extra information on the slides that I will not talk about, but that you can refer to by consulting the slides. Next, please. Starting with what data are collected in the U.S. Next slide. And I promise that this slide will be as technical as I will get, but it's very dense. This table compares the two best data sets for collecting data on race and ethnicity in the US, the decennial census and the American Community Survey. The decennial census has been taken every 10 years since 1790. 
And the ACS is a continuous survey with data available since 2005. Next. Simplifying. In the census through 1930, all questions were asked of everyone, so-called 100% data. Next. Between 1940 and 2000, there were some basic questions that were asked of everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so-called 100% data eventually collected on what it was called a short form. Other socioeconomic questions were asked of a sample of the population collected on a separate long form. Next. However, beginning in 2010, the census asked only the basic short form questions. Next. The ACS rather took over the role of asking those long form questions. What questions were asked? Next. In the lower table for the later years, the short form asked basic questions such as race, Hispanic or Latino origin, age, sex, and a few others. The long form asked all of the short form questions plus questions such as place of birth, ancestry, income, citizenship, language spoken at home, et cetera, and depending on the year. So it's important to remember that currently you can gather 100% data on race and ethnicity from the census and on a sample basis from the ACS. But beginning in 2010, the rich socioeconomic data are available only from the ACS and only on a sample basis. Next, please. Although we're focusing on race and ethnicity, there are many other closely related variables available in some years in the census. Uh, this table is extracted from a bureau publication, and it shows that color or race have been asked since 1790 in one way or another, but also Spanish origin or descent ancestry, ethnic origin, free or slave, or national shame, place of birth, place of birth of parents, citizenship, naturalization, immigration, language, language of parents. Next, please. And this is the same table through 2000. And you can see that the question on Spanish or origin or descent in the second line was first introduced as such in 1970. On the right, I added information about the 2010 and the 2020 censuses. And remember in those censuses, only the short form questions such as race and Hispanic origin are available. The other variables are only available through the ACS. Next. And next, please. One more next in. Thank you. Let's turn to how data are collected next. In particular, how are respondents classified by race? According to Harry Shel Henry Sheldon from the 1790 through the 1950 censuses, the enumerator had been instructed to classify the respondent by race without asking a question, except when he was uncertain about the proper classification. Beginning with the 1960 census and in the ACS, the enumeration has been conducted largely by mail, more recently online. From that time, people have usually self-responded to the questions. Next, please. To show you what the questions on race and ethnicity look like, this is an extract from the 2010 questionnaire to, to which people self-responded. Question eight at the top asks, is person one of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? One can answer no, or yes, Mexican, Mexican-American, or Chicano, or yes, Puerto Rican, yes, Cuban, yes, other please specify. Question nine asks about what person, person one's race is. Mark one or more boxes. Choices are white, black, African-American, or Negro, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian Indian, Chinese, and so on. Notice, please, that one was invited to check one or more boxes on the race question. And this was new as of Census 2000. It was done to allow those with a multiracial background to self-identify. 
As a result, according to the Bureau quote, the census 2000 data on race are not directly comparable with data from the 1990 census or earlier censuses. Caution must be used when interpreting changes in the racial composition of the US population over time. Another important thing to note, the note at the top of the excerpt reads, please answer both question eight about Hispanic origin and question nine about race. For this census, Hispanic origins are not races. Well, in fact, respondents are understandably confused about the distinction between Hispanic origin and race and do not always respond in the way that the designers of this distinction expect them to. Obviously, this is a problem and the Census Bureau has long been examining the issue. Next, please. This slide provides more information on that and other current challenges for data on race and ethnicity. Next, next, and next. And now we'll look at how data are disseminated with some examples. Next, please. This is a detailed table showing the number of Hispanics or Latinos from 2010, to which I've added colors and asterisks to help you guide your attention. At the top in orange is the total pop of the US, over 308 million. In green, the number of Hispanics, over 50 million. And one can also see the number of those Hispanics who identified as Mexican or Costa Rican, et cetera. Next. Next, please. This is a garish table, an excerpt of all that would fit from a single, very detailed table of race from 2010. Because one could choose one or more races, the Bureau provides data for over 60, 60 race categories alone or in combination. At the top left in orange is the total pop of over 308 million. Below that in blue, the totals of those who chose only one race, white alone or black alone or American Indian and Alaska Native alone and so on. Then in green, the total of those who stated that they were of two or more ra uh, races over 9 million. And that includes the lines in pink, those who said that they were of two races, um, for instance, white and black, over 1.8 million, or Asian and some other race. In lilac, those who said that they were of three races. In the middle in blue, those who were of four races on the right in green of five races, and in purple, uh, the 792 people who said that they were of all six racial categories. Next. Next, please, Anne. And this ta table cross tabulates Hispanic and race. Next. One can get decennial census and ACS data from many sources, either as tables, or summary data, or as microdata, including from IPMS, which Bob Wright will talk more about, curated data from ICPSR, from various tools and publications from the Census Bureau, Social Explorer, a commercial product, and the census schedules through 1950 are also mostly available. Next, please. With that in mind, let's look briefly at how race and ethnicity have been asked in the census historically. Next. This visualization from the Census Bureau tracks race and ethnic classifications over time. Next. Zooming in on just 1890, the categories used were white, black, and again, please excuse the vocabulary that was used at the time, a lot of quadroon, octoroon, Chinese, Japanese, and Indian. According to the Census Bureau, the categories Chinese and then Japanese were added as there was an increase in immigration from those areas. Also, according to the Bureau, quote, pressure to further assess race science theories heightened, resulting in Congress mandating the introduction of supplementary black blood quantum categories, quadroon and octoroon, for the 1890 census, unquote. In certain racist laws, people having any amount of so-called black blood could be subject to discrimination under the so-called one drop rule. 
as William Seltzer notes, in the United States, as in many other countries around the world, population censuses have been an important tool for both advancing and repressing human rights. Next, please. And I leave you with this summary from an interview with Margot Anderson, an academic authority on the census. Tensions have swirled around the census since it began in 1790. Whatever the hot button issue of the time is, says Anderson, gets tangled up in the census. That's because the regular counting of the population has never been an academic exercise, she says. The census is a basis for deciding how to apportion political power, as well as how to dole out billions in federal funds. Every 10 years, we shuffle the deck, she says, and take power away from areas of the country that are not growing as fast as others. Well, thank you. On to the UK. Okay, hi there. I'm Nigel Tinoa. Uh, next slide, please. Um, from the UK Data Service. And um, actually, our, our race data was just released yesterday. So um, I might drop in a couple of observations about that, but it's been quite muted conversations about it so far. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'm going to cover is how race and migration are represented in the census, how um, that's changed over time, the groups that are identified, and some implications for the way we talk about race and migration in the UK. Um, and lastly, to look at a couple of other sources of data. Next slide, please. So first of all, the context. The UK has three statistical authorities. Um, they determine questions differently, and there are differences in the race ethnic categories used. Um, England, Wales and Northern Ireland um, censuses have started to be published. Um, Scotland was delayed a year because of the pandemic, so we expect their results to be start being released next year. At the moment, we're seeing univariate tables at different scales. Um, and in the UK, we've got an ambition to move the population data derived from administrative data it was used significantly to produce the census estimates. Um, and there's a lot of work going on within the statistical authority in England and Wales, uh, looking at the individual level data within the census and within administrative sources. Next slide, please. So what we get is um, aggregate data, and we tend to use ethnicity as a proxy measure of race. But there are other measures as well which are, are used. So language, national identity, passports, and in the UK context, to kind of focus on religion. So yesterday we became a um, minority Christian country, which, which seemed to kind of suck in most of the, um, the, the media coverage. Um, our use of ethnicity is a very messy term, so uh, it can be based on the country that people come from, on the continent, or on the diaspora. So, for example, we use Black African, Gypsy and Traveller, Indian. Um, and we also kind of focus quite a lot on migration. So we use country of birth and year of arrival in the UK as proxies for migration. Um, later on, we also get flow data that tells us about internal, international internal migration based on the address a year before the census. Um, so as well as that, next year we will receive census microdata. Um, so we have a safeguarded version we hold that has a 5% individual sample with a relatively four categories of indicators, a 1% sample of households with relatively little information, and within our secure service, we provide 10% samples with, um, of household and individual data. Next slide, please. So this is an example from 2011 microdata, um, looking at housing deprivation by race and migration status. And it's interesting, really, I suppose, that the big story is that the more recently you came to the UK, the more likely you are to suffer housing deprivation um, across all ethnic groups, um, and some groups particularly have higher levels of housing deprivation. Next slide, please. So the census has run every year, 10 years from 1851, except in 1941. Uh, ethnicity was introduced quite late in 1991. Um, this is a... Um, 
there were some trials of the 10% samples looking at ethnicity. And in 1971, there was questions about parents, parents, um, place of birth, whether it was in the new Commonwealth. Um, but since the first census, we've always asked the question about whether people were born in Ireland and overseas. More recently, we asked specific um, about specific countries. Uh, next slide, please. So what that tends to be translated to in our media discourse is a highlight to the threat of the white British way of life. Um, so the first release on migration highlighted the number of people from other countries. At that time, there was an unfortunate in incident in a, a detention center, which was severely overcrowded. It was attacked by a um, person with dubious views. And there was kind of national scandal, which then morphed into talking about the largest number coming uh, across the channel in, in boats, which were from Albania. Um, I said there was likely to be similar coverage about the ethnic minority population. Actually, um, that hasn't happened so far in the media I read, um, but it is quite uh, possible it will do. The focus, as I said, has been on religion. Um, next slide, please. So looking at the kind of categories we use, um, in the white category, we use UK, Irish, uh, in 2011, we introduced Gypsy and Irish Traveller. Uh, 2021, we introduced Roma, um, and we have another category. We then have a set of mixed categories based on um, our connections with new Commonwealth countries and other mixed groups. Um, we have the Asian categories, again, very much linked to our links, our new Commonwealth uh, countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Chinese, and other Asian. Black African, Black Caribbean, and Black other, and Arab. There's also a writing category, which I've been looking at, but it's quite confusing because I don't think people understand the question very well. Um, next slide, please. So just to kind of look at other sources of data, we have um, a longitudinal study, Understanding Society. This graph is taken from, um, from a co set of COVID waves that ran during the pandemic, um, looking at housing arrears by ethnicity and bill payment arrears by ethnicity. And it showed a kind of quite stark racial difference. So this um, survey uses the same categories as the census. Um, next slide, please. And similarly, we have administrative data. So this is taken from uh, statutory homeless presentations. Um, there are other sources like benefit claimers, educational performance. Um, they link to a level of statistical geography, so they can be linked together with the census, but there are likely to be some data quality issues, particularly um, with administrative data, as some of the sources are assigned by officers or not, um, not clearly defined. Um, so that's a kind of picture of, of the UK. Um, look forward to the conversation later on. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Anja. I'm from Germany. Uh, I'm in Cologne, Germany. I work at Gesis. And uh, at Gesis, we also host the German Data Archive for the Social Sciences, where I work as uh, work in data uh, acquisition and also in research data management training. Um, I am German and um, I spent some time in the US. Um, and when I first came to the US in my mid 20s, that was really the first time that I was confronted with the question about my race. So there are various forms that you fill out um, and they ask about race and I was very surprised by it. And now, of course, I know I identify as a white person, uh, but still it, um, it puzzled me and uh, I wondered why that is and uh, also why in Germany we do not uh, talk about race. And I want to share um, with you why that is. Uh, next, please. Um, so as you know, Germany has a very terrible past with racism. 
um, under the Nazi regime in the 1930s and 40s, and millions of people were deported and later killed by the Nazis. And uh, that was only because um, they belonged to the wrong race. And I hope that you uh, saw the quotation marks that I used here. And when we talk about race in German until now, we still use this term as uh, purely biological. And that is to point out that this was a biological th theory that was proved wrong and that was terribly misused by our ancestors in the past. And we want to uh, remember that and want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And um, in English, as I learned um, only by working with this group here and uh, also while preparing for this webinar today, I learned that this is increasingly used as a social construct. So there's already a difference in our languages when we use the term race. Um, next, please. Um, we still use um, the term race uh, sometimes. Uh, for example, in uh, in our law, um, here's an example. That's our this Article Three of our Constitution, and it says no person shall be favored or disfavored because of, and then there are a number of items including race. And there is currently a discussion to replace this term in our Constitution, and it's a very sensitive discussion because we cannot just delete uh, this uh, this term. Um, uh, next, please. Um, because we know that uh, not speaking of race doesn't mean that racism doesn't exist and it does still exist in Germany. Um, so this is a very long and very um, careful discussion of uh, which term we use to replace it in our constitution. Um, next, please. Uh, and also, since we don't ask about race in our official statistics, um, we don't have data about uh, racism, at least not on the official uh, statistical side. So um, I found this quote in an article in The Guardian um, that we don't know how much um, people of color are, for example, stopped by the police, are discriminated against, and also during the pandemic uh, are more, more likely uh, to die of the coronavirus. Um, next, please. So for our German census, we use um, the definition of migration background, and not only in the census, also in uh, all official statistics, and also very many social surveys, social science surveys use this definition, also to be comparable to official statistics and also to compare the surveys um, uh, with each other. And according to this definition, immigrants are all residents who entered uh, the current territory of Germany after 1949, and that has changed, this cutoff year has changed recently um, to 1955 in the census. Then also immigrants are all non-citizens who were born in Germany, and also all Germans with at least one parent born abroad or born as a uh, non-citizen. Um, next, please. Of course, uh, this definition that I just gave you um, has its flaws. So take, for example, an Austrian immigrant. Um, Austria is a country south of Germany. Um, we look the same, we speak the same language. Our cultures are very uh, similar. So this person uh, would not have difficulties to integrate in our society to, for example, find uh, work, um, whereas a black German would still be discriminated um, based on uh, their skin color. And so this person would probably struggle to find work and would need to get in line um, at the unemployment office. Um, but from the, the data itself, because we do not um, uh, measure skin color or race or anything, we don't see why this one immigrant is successful, but this one German person is not. Um, next, please. We do have other uh, have other sources to uh, analyze racism, and I want to present uh, some of them to you. So we have the Central Register of Foreign Nationals. Now, this is a database that is compiled by the Ministry of uh, Immigration and Refugees. It is a very rich database on foreign nationals, and it's uh, newly available only since last year. It's available for researchers. Now, this database only includes foreign nationals, so we don't we can not compare them to um, uh, the German nationals, but still it's a very rich database um, about this group. Um, next. 
Uh, we have the German victimization uh, survey that is done by the Federal Bureau uh, of Investigation, so basically the German FBI. Um, there, you the respondents can identify of belonging to one of the largest immigration groups. So, for example, they can say that their grandparents came from Russia or from Turkey. And also when um, they ask about specific attacks, uh, the respondents can specify what the assumed reason for this attack was. So that could um, possibly be motivated by racism, for example. Um, next, please. Um, then we have the socioeconomic panel. That's a panel that uh, reaches back until 1984. But in 1996, a question about ethnicity was uh, added. So uh, the question is actually very directly, do you, do, do you experience any or did you experience any disadvantages um, due to your ethnicity? And then uh, a very new development is that they include questions uh, on discrimination according to a specific German law. That's the General Act on Equal Treatment. So they will have questions in their survey um, about perceived discrimination due to various factors, including um, racism. Um, next, please. We have another panel, the National Education Panel, and that's a very uh, rich panel study with a focus on education and labor market participation. And they also ask about perceived discrimination since 2012. So in 2012, they included questions about it. And uh, they um, develop uh, survey instruments or so new questions about discrimination. And also, they are very um, uh, concerned with avoiding the term race as well. So they find other ways. And for example, they also um, test questions about how a person perceives uh, themselves uh, and how this person is perceived by others. So a person can identify as German, but might uh, um, be identified by others as non-German because they might have an accent or they might have a different skin color. Um, next, please. Uh, so the last uh, but not least um, database that I want to introduce you to is the Racism Monitor. And there we have ethnicity that can be linked to uh, discrimination experience, um, but also they test attitudes about racism. Um, uh, even like if you were, if, if, if you say you were not uh, discriminated or you don't you did not have this experience before but they ask you questions whether you agree or not agree um, with statements like racism uh, a joke can also be racist or a compliment can also be racist um, thank you very much hello i'm Bobby Bordlon and i am the economics librarian at Princeton University Next. So my colleagues have illustrated, even within a single country, how difficult it is to be able to um, try to look at the questions that we're facing today uh, and how it's changed over time. So I have the easy part. What I'm doing is I'm going to focus primarily on one source that many of us use regularly, IPUMS International. But I do want to point out it's not complete. Well, they do an amazing job, they do not have all the censuses. So as an example, for Canada, they have many years, including um, some historic ones, but they do not have the ones that end in the year six. As Kevin pointed out, uh, Canada does every five years. So ICPSR has the 1976, uh, but the Canadians themselves actually have um, all of the years. And University of British Columbia has actually used their open data license to make uh, the data available. And then, of course, the summary data is available for free through Statistics Canada. Uh, Germany has some old surveys, uh, including East Germany and West Germany on IPOMS itself. And then, um, but the 2011 and the 2022, which is being conducted now, um, those are not available on IPOMS, but are available through. Um, German sites. The United Kingdom, uh, we have many of the years available, uh, but again, not all of them. So uh, 61, 71, 81, 2011 are available directly from the UK Data Archive, but not through 
um, IPMs. And then for the United States, it gets a little bit more confusing even because there's IPMs International, which is what I'm going to go into for a comparative. And they have many, but they actually don't have all of them. Whereas IPMs USA has all of them. And then one of my favorites is for summary data is called Social Explorer, which Barbara mentioned, which is um, summary information. And then of course, datacensus.gov, you can get free summary information next. So IPMs International, I think, you know, many of us use this very regularly. It has 547 censuses. Um, next slide. So the first thing you always have to do is you're gonna to have to make a decision as to what it is that you want. And I just want to point out that I know not everyone necessarily works with microdata or um, is able to use uh, SAS, SPSS, data, R. And so you actually do have an option to do simple cross tabs uh, online. But I'm going to focus on the micro side, uh, assuming that you are using Stata, SAS, et cetera. Next slide. So the first thing you're going to do is it's going to tell you to select your samples. Next slide. It goes on forever. It's done by tab. You can look at all regions just to point out um, the different ones that are here. And each country is going to be different years. What they attempt to do is to try to have a census from each decade if it exists and if they're able to negotiate it. Next. So I brought up Canada as an example. And we see that they do not have the years ending in six, but they do have the years ending in one. And they also have a number of historic censuses. Next. Um, let's see. So now um, we're going to start choosing variables. And so the first thing to remember is at the household level, you would be looking for things such as geography, uh, as well as characteristics of the house itself. And then for the person, it's going to be everything else. So this will be things like race, ethnicity, migration, uh, education, etc. So I have uh, for Canada itself, and if you notice race or color, we have from a couple of years, but not necessarily all the years. Uh, we have religion, which of course the US does not do. So we have different variables and they're not necessarily the each year. So one of the things just to be aware of is even within a country as uh, my presenter, my co-presenters have pointed out, um, something may not always be there and things do change. And we haven't even gotten into how the variables change. So next slide. Now we start seeing by race within IPMS whether or not the different categories are there. The other thing IPMS is really good at is there's a lot of documentation. So it's often an easy way to find for a lot of places what they're doing. Uh, you can also, I did not include a slide for case count, but you can also click on case count and you would actually see how many people within the sample identified as one of these races. Next. And I brought some examples of the documentation. So um, first there's a general, and they do say that it's largely comparable within countries over time, uh, but you need to do it over caution. Um, it means different things in different places. White is the only one that is fairly consistently available. And of course we know from Germany that it's not even there, uh, any of the race questions. And then the other thing they talk about is mixed races, that it's quite different in terms of how it may be done. Next. And they also have similar things for each country. So for example, in Canada, uh, Kevin told us about the visible minorities. Uh, that is there. Some of the other things that have been done over time, how they have changed. Again, the language, which was whatever was used at that point in time. Next. UK has a very simple one, just basically talks about Northern Ireland. Um, next. And the United States, um, there's quite a bit of detail. It actually goes on for a few screens, but it talks about how um, it's changed dramatically over time. Next. And it continues, next. I do wanna point out that while we're, when we're using IPMS, we're typically looking at what are called the harmonized. So what they're trying to do is finding things that are in common. It doesn't mean for every census, not even every census within a country, 
but they attempt to find things that cut across many places. The unharmonized, these will be things that are specific to the country. So it could be something that uh, does not exist in any other nation. Um, I find um, not dealing with race, but particularly with geography, there's often much more refined geography. So keep in mind uh, the source variables also, but if you're doing com comparisons, then you're going to be largely sticking to the harmonized. Next. So nativity and birthplace, uh, this is a separate category in IPOMS. And you can see that uh, some of them, such as nativity status, uh, with the exception of Germany, uh, most places tended to have, country of birth was pretty common, uh, but it changes. It depends on the variable and it even depends on the year. Next. And then um, we're not gonna click on this, but um, I do have a guide uh, that I, and I know many others use pretty heavily that looks at censuses from around the world. I do wanna point out that there are some things on it uh, that are not available, um, you know, that are only available at Princeton or if your place has purchased this, but the majority are to IPOMS and to other uh, sources. And then now we're going to turn it over to our next person. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, so let's just um, finish off before we go into the Q and A. So, just wanted to say a huge thank you to all our speakers today. That's given us a really great insight into data on race and ethnicity and other aspects of our identity in these four countries. Now, obviously there are a lot of other topics we could cover, um, but we've, we've tried to cram as much information in as we can into this, this one webinar. Now, I've just seen a couple of people asking whether the slides are going to be available. Yes, they will be sent round, they'll be made available online. So any of the links in there, you'll be able to access those directly once those slides are available. So look out for, for those. So we'd really want to turn this over to, to you now as, as our um, colleagues and our audience. So as we said at the beginning of the webinar, this is really what we think is, is just the very beginning of this conversation about um, race and ethnicity in data. And we hope that this is a conversation that we can carry on over the coming months. Just want to remind you about the um, anti-racism resource group that we're all members of. We have the link here on the screen and I think Alex put this in the chat as well so you can just click on it directly. The website is now um, up I believe. We've been collecting information about important resources for anti-racism research so please do go and have a look. We have some initial essays on these different countries and we really would just like to invite you to get in touch and get involved. If you want to join the group, then you are more than welcome. The more people, the merrier. So please do get in touch. What we'd also like, um, if we could go to the next slide, Anne, please. What we'd also like to know from you is what sort of topics you would like to cover in, in future webinars. So we hope to run a series of webinars and we're looking for ideas of what would be of most value and interest to you. Again, we've got this link in the, in the chat. Thank you, Alex. Please pop over to this Google form, just fill it out, let us know what you're interested in. If you would also be interested in joining one of the webinars as a presenter, if there's a particular topic that you would like to talk about in one of the webinars, then again, let us know via the Google form. We would absolutely love to have you involved. 
All right, so I'm just going to have a look through the chat to see if we have any questions for the panel. I know we've had some questions already and the panel members who have not been speaking at the time have already put some responses in. Um, but if you have any additional questions, please do put them in there. I'm just going to make sure there is nothing we've missed in there. So we had a great question from Thomas about the, the methodology of name analysis as a way to infer race and ethnicity from, for example, marketing data that otherwise doesn't contain any um, identifiers. And there's some nice discussion in the chat, so please do have a look. Um, but I just wonder if any of the other panelists have any additional comments. Yeah, I could say something about the US. Um, it's my understanding that um, the use of Spanish surname to identify people as Hispanic was given up because of the inherent difficulties. Um, so um, in many or all of the Spanish cultures that I am aware of, um, there are two names used coming from the, the parents. Um, another problem was that someone could want to identify as Hispanic but not have a Spanish surname or vice versa. And there were various other problems that, that uh, led them to give up the use of that technique in the US for the census. Thanks, Barbara. Any more comments from the panel on that particular issue? Uh, just one other comment. Um, so there are a few companies. So one question um, that does get posed a lot is for executives, people who work in companies, etc. And there are some places that do include, but they only include if the executive has self-disclosed. And so uh, ISS, risk metrics, um, does have ethnicity. Um, and then Board X also does that. Again, it's not for every individual, but if the person has self-disclosed. Most of the other sources I've seen, if they do include, it tends to be doing the bad practice that we just talked about. I seem to remember at the, I think it was the ISIS conference this year, there was a presentation around this this topic i don't know whether anybody else attended that session and i i can't remember the researcher's name unfortunately but the presentations i think are available on the isis website bob ray's knob knobbing great um so it might be worth having a look at that if you're interested what i remember from the presentation was that they had been carried, carrying out some analysis to see how effective this was. And they'd identified certain groups of names which were problematic. But that's, that's as far as my memory goes. So if you're interested, then do go um, onto the ISIS website and, and have a look for that presentation. Okay, any other questions? There is a question in the chat now, Deborah. Uh, yeah. And a very interesting one. From Charles. Um, it was mentioned a few times that there are discrepancies in the vocabulary used both by a country over time and between countries. Are there any groups working on best practice standards or vocabularies themselves to improve semantic interoperability? Um, do any of the panelists have thoughts on how interoperability could become a reality for census data? That's a great question. 
Like, I think the first would be within a nation to try to reconcile. And I think we already saw the problems that exist there because often you can't, you can't reverse engineer. So if something was either too inclusive or too exclusive, you can't go back. So I, I don't really see that as feasible. What I could see is, again, as IPMs, as the group that's certainly done the most with trying to harmonize censuses, um, you know, they've already done a certain amount of that in terms of notes. Now, it's not the same as direct linking, and I, and I really don't see them directly linking because, again, each place does have very different meaning. Uh, but I think the first would be within countries to try to provide the equivalent of a concordance. Thanks, Bob Ray. Any other comments on that? Yeah, I think it's very difficult to think about um, translating the concepts. Um, particularly, I mean, I suppose from the UK, we're interested in the European context, but as my colleague from Germany has said, there is a kind of failure to recognize race in a number of the European censuses. And um, I think that makes it quite challenging to think about how to harmonize categories, um, particularly when they're constructed socially, um, partly as a mechanism of control. So. I think there's a kind of need to critically engage with them from the point of view of being a, a scholar using that data. I'm not sure how international comparison works um, because not very few of the censuses allow self-identification in a meaningful way. Most of them tend to use a fixed set of categories, which looking at the kind of open-ended responses to the UK census data clearly don't match what a significant number of people will classify themselves as. And I'll throw this in from a much less educated standpoint. Um, the United Nations has been doing work to support the development of statistical practices in its member nations. Um, whether any, any attempt to address this, these issues is as part of that, uh, I don't know. And, and for the various reasons mentioned, is it a, um, a task beyond possibility? <laughs> so there's that. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Nigel. Um, I have something from the US um, on, a, on a slightly different topic that I just want to make sure that, that people who uh, work in the US are aware of. Um, the uh, US government, is currently reviewing, and I put this in the chat, reviewing and revising standards for maintaining, collecting, presenting federal data on race and ethnicity. So um, I gave you a link there, and you probably also want to keep an eye on the Federal Register for uh, calls for input. Great, thanks, Barbara. Um, any ideas on criminal justice data and statistics. So um, Chris was saying that the criminal justice data and statistics lib guide has a category suggested by a criminal justice professor on racial and ethnic disparities in criminal justice. Um, they've used ISIS anti-racist resources for the US, great to hear that people are using them. Um, do we know of any data from other countries in that area? So Canada, um, UK and Germany, or any other country for that matter? I'll jump in and say um, the list that we're developing are global. They're not intended to be US focused. Um, I'm, I should introduce myself. I'm Michelle Hazlett. I'm chairing, currently co-chairing the group with Anya. Um, but we are limited by the fact that the majority of our membership is US-based. And so if others from other countries would like to contribute either data sources about race or 
rubrics, articles, tools for rooting out racism from research, we would love to have you join the group and add resources to our lists. Um, someone asked earlier about accessing the lists and those are not available on the website yet. They're still cleaning up metadata kind of uh, behind the scenes. So we're hoping to release those lists in 2023. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle, that's great. Um, yeah, please do, do get in touch if you want to get involved. As we say, the more the merrier, I think. Um, any other resources that we know off the top of our head? Alex has put a link in for yeah. Canada from Stat Canada. Yeah, that's their, um, that link I put in goes to their main crime and justice statistics page. Um, one of the difficult issues <laughs> with Canada in finding um, any sort of um, visible minority race data connected with things like crime and justice is you kind of have to go into a, a um, into a survey to see if that question was asked, um, the visible minority question or immigration question or anything like that. So it's a little tricky now. There have lately, um, Statistics Canada has released a number of um, reports and um, analysis that does include data on indigenous and racialized um, uh, racialized identity within certain re, um, certain report, um, sorry, certain statistics around crime and justice. And I'm just going to put in a link to one called Police Reported Indigenous and Racialized Identity Statistics via the Uniform Crime Reporting Survey. Um, so you kind of have to look for the various things that could uh, various reports that StatCan writes that could have the data and then within the report look at the tables that they've included and see what the source is and then go to that source. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a going around and, and finding stuff and then finding the stuff that you want. Um, but on that crime and, and justice statistics page, um, if you do look at the analysis and report section, that's probably the quickest way to find data that would have some sort of link to visible minority, visible minorities, race, ethnicity, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they split the data into correctional services, courts, crimes and offenses, and victimization. Um, and one survey, if you're looking for data related specifically to the people who are victims, um, <clears throat> Statistics Canada has a great survey called, it's the general, I'm just going to type the name in here, um, general social sur survey, and the topic you want to look for is victimization, victimization. So the general social survey is um, a set of surveys that go back to 1985. And every year is a different topic and they repeat topics around every five years. So um, if you find the victimization one, I think the most current one is from around 2015 or 2017. And then if you go back five years, it'll be another victimization one. So it's not um, current to every year, but um, it is an excellent survey. Um, if you're looking for statistics on um, the types of crimes and the types of victims uh, that are out there. And just keep in mind that this is a self-reported, um, so it won't match up with data that comes from um, Corrections Canada or from any of the um, other crime and justice statistics that are reported through policing agencies across Canada. Uh, that's sort of the quickest um sort of lesson on finding those kind of statistics in Canada so in the chat I'm also going to add the link to the guide that Kevin mentioned uh when he started talking about Canadian statistics our um data on racialized populations 
in that guide, there is a list of um, various different um, surveys and, and data from Statistics Canada, but also from some provincial and municipal sites that have um, that are about crime and justice. And um, yeah, that's for Canada. I, that's sort of the top ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, um, the, I can't remember who asked the question. If you do have questions about Canada, you can certainly email either either Kevin Rosa or I. Um, and on the next slide is a list of this is the contact information for everybody involved in this webinar. And um, our emails are there. Kevin Rosen and my email are there if you want to get in touch with us and we can have a more in-depth conversation about that. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's super. Thanks, Alex. Just for yeah, I've just the... put, I've just oh, put a link no, in the right. chat here. Um, so there's a, a research center uh, called the Center on the Dynamics of Ethnicity. That's a website ethnicity.ac.uk. I just had a quick scan of it. They've got some research on racism on the bench in terms of sentencing. Um, there is a survey that will be available through the um, data, UK data services next spring, which has quite a lot of evidence on um, experiences of racism. Um, so that's a non-probabilistic survey with probably the largest ratio of minoritized groups, including groups that we don't normally see in um, survey data. So for, for us, the uh, gypsy and traveler communities are um, difficult to engage with in terms of statistics. And that was that was kind of done, uh, it, an effective sample size was achieved. Um, the, there's also work going on there about policing and about um, policing schools and so on. So a number of criminal justice type links. Great, I think that's going to be a really valuable survey that one. So I'm, I'm really happy that that uh, is, is proven to be so successful. It's always quite a nervous moment when a new survey is proposed, whether they get the funding and whether they can put it into, into practice. So I'm really really happy. That they yeah, I mean, the survey has been completed. I think the issue is um, dealing with the non-probabilistic elements mm -hmm. of the to make it to make it um, a, so that you can draw inferences from it. So there's been a lot of work going on on the weighting of that, which is quite a technical exercise for anybody who's interested in that aspect of the work. Not an easy job. The other one for the UK to maybe have a look at is the crime survey for England and Wales. I haven't looked at it in for the recent years um, of data, but they do ask a lot of questions about um, discrimination, victimization, and they do ask or have asked in the past some questions about why people experience discrimination. So what grounds did they believe that to be. Um, so it might be worth having a look at that and I'll just pop the link to the UK data services um, data catalogue there if you want to go and explore. Can't guarantee it's what you want in there but they do have some interesting questions. Um, okay. Let me just have a quick scan through, make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, um, Deborah, just... while, you're, while you're checking <laughs> the questions, I added two sources for Germany. One is the police crime statistic. Um, I quickly checked, uh, they distinguish between German and non-German, and then they have some statistics more uh, detailed for the largest immigration groups like Turkish, Italian, Romanian, but nothing about race, as I said before. And then I also um, put a link in the chat to the German victimization survey, which I mentioned in my talk. Great, thank you. Joanne's just put a link to a recording um, for a talk that happened, uh, which was research to improve improve future race and ethnicity data in the US census. 
So feel free to access that link and have a watch if that's of interest. Um, okay. We've got about five or six minutes left. So are there any last, last questions or any last comments from the panel before I wrap up? So I had a couple of private messages asking about the chat. And so I am saving the chat. I'm going to attempt to slightly clean it up. Things that were not really related, I'll take out. But a lot of the links are valuable and I know uh, would be difficult if they were not in the presentation. So I'll find a way to include that with the uh, um, slides once it goes up. Great. Um, Marilyn asked about um, uh, or mentioned that it would be great to have representatives from Latin America or Central America um, to be involved in this work. I wonder if someone could talk about why we chose these countries uh, to work on and not other countries. Honestly, the answer to that is we got volunteers from these countries. <laughs> so it is wide open. We would love to have more countries represented in this collection of essays. Yes, I agree. Um, thank you, Marilyn. It's a great idea. Uh, everyone is welcome to add their country to the country essays, but also maybe we can have a, a follow up on this seminar here. And we did talk about it a little bit to include more countries. And I know I remember I reached out uh, to Uganda, for example, we have strong, ISIS has strong ties to Uganda. Um, I just didn't follow up. Uh, basically, I went on vacation right after and I didn't get around to it. But we will, it's a good idea to extend the countries and have more talks like this. Yeah, just a, a comment. Um, you know, we are membership based. We welcome um, everyone. Um, you know, we're, we're very cheap. We're 50 bucks US. Um, but our membership is about 50% US, uh, about 20% Canada, um, you know, about 20% all of Europe. So we have many years ago, probably about eight, nine years ago, we, had, we made a huge effort to try to get people from Latin America. There were very few data archives. Um, so it was very difficult. We have done really good, I think, with trying to get many members from Africa. Um, so uh, we do have people from Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we do not have as many Asian countries represented as we would like. But uh, for any of you with colleagues out there or any of you from out there, we welcome you to join and most of all to contribute. And if you are not able to join now but would like to contribute, we'll still most uh, likely, we will definitely welcome you. Absolutely. And just to follow up, um, Marilyn, if you have um, contacts that you think would be interested in talking to us or joining the group, then yes, absolutely, we would love um, we would love it if you could email us some of those um, contacts. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, um, I might have a few contacts. The only issue might be translation, uh, because as you may know, you know, in Latin American, English is not, you know, pretty proficient. Um, so we might need to work around, you know, like having a translation, you know, like being provided so that they can, um, you know, like express themselves freely in their own language and not have any issues. Um, and the other problem is that, you know, like I is finding somebody that, you know, is, is fluent in like the terms and technical, you know, like concepts we use here because, you know, like um, I think like I can, you know, volunteer, I will be happy to, but it might, you know, cut me off of guard with some terms because I'm not so so just throwing it that if we are you know being inclusive um you know those are some of the things mm -hmm. that we might need to consider um to include in other uh communities but definitely I just like it just came to my mind as we were talking about you know like how sometimes race and ethnicity is not a clear cut from you know like uh for Spanish you know communities or Latino communities um 
And it will be interesting how they ask those questions, how they frame those questions, um, what is the purpose, how they see it. And even like uh, how, how often, you know, like I feel here when I came, I'm from Colombia, by the way, <laughs> as you can tell from my accent. Um, um, so like I barely answer questions about race and ethnicity. Like it was not really, you know, common in our countries to ask those questions. But here, like I go to the doctor and I, I see it, like and I go here and there and I, I'm always, you know, answering these questions. And then something else I'll throw out there is that for some reason, um, like there is a, a distinction, I don't know, mostly for health, you know, related things. They ask you a question, are you Hispanic ori origins? Yes or no? And then th that, like if you answer yes or no, like they don't ask if you are from Asia, from other countries, like they just care if you are Latino, Hispanic. Is it a good? Is it a bad? Like, I don't know why they only ask you that. And like, mm -hmm. we were talking with an, a friend that is from Israel. She was like, I felt kind of like offended that they were saying that, like, you know, they, they didn't take into consideration. I'm Israeli and like, no, nobody cares if I'm Israeli. Like, what are the things? Anyway, just that will be another conversation. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, like that, that could be, you know, like um, knowing their, you know, background, history, and perspective might, you know, inform how we're asking the questions here. And um, as I, I was telling Barbara um, Leverwood, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the last name correctly, my research is actually understanding how Latino adolescents are developing their ethnic identity while growing up in the United States. Um, which all these confusions, you know, we think, oh yeah, you are confused, but like that really marks adolescents when they are growing up, answering those questions, facing those questions for the first time is actually marking their identity, which really has, you know, psychosocial issues for them later on. Um, so thank you so much for these conversations. It's really great, great to be, you know, part and like people are talking about this. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And you raise you raise some really important things actually that we we really need to consider. And the language side and whether language is a barrier to getting people involved from other countries is something that we we absolutely do need to think about. So I'm really happy you mentioned that. Thank you. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we will see you in some other meetings of the group, perhaps. It would be lovely to have your perspective, um, if if that's possible. Yes, um, I, I got this from one of um, the faculties in my high school, because as I said, like, I mean this, so I was, you know, lucky I got into this, but if you want my email, I can like send it. If you want to add me in the mailing list, I don't know. Um, so I just can share my email and I will be happy to be part of these conversations. Great. Great, thank you. Yes, if you're happy to just pop us your email, that's great. We'll we'll be in touch. All right, so I'm just conscious of time and we've done so well to stay exactly on schedule. I don't want to ruin it by being the one that, that drags us into overtime. So I'm gonna wrap up there. I think we got to everybody's questions um, either in this Q&A or throughout the, the webinar, but if we find any that we've missed, then apologies, we tried to get to everybody. So that's the end of our time. As we've said you know, a few times, please do feel free to get in touch either through the Google form or you can see all the contact details for any of us as speakers. So if you have further questions or comments, then absolutely please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Um, any volunteers for future webinars as well, don't forget, you know, we would really love to hear your suggestions. One last reminder that the ISIS conference is happening in May next year. The call for abstracts is open and it's open for the next few weeks. Uh, Bobri put the link 
in or Kevin put the link into the chat. Here we go, Kevin, thank you. Now, the theme of the conference is actually diversity in research, social justice from data. So this fits really nicely in with the, the area that we're, we're all interested in. So we hope we will see as many of you there at the conference as possible. It is going to be hybrid again this year. So if you can't or don't want to travel all the way to the US, don't worry, you can join online. So we've tried to make it as accessible as possible. But for now, we would just like to thank you all very much for coming along today. We hope that you found the webinar interesting. We certainly found it interesting to hear your comments and questions. And we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in future webinars.